Good evening, everyone. I'm Amy Miller of Atlanta Celebrates Photography. Welcome to this final event of the 2009 ACP Festival. It's sad but true. What a finale this will be, though. This event is a wonderful first-time collaboration between ACP, the Atlanta Contemporary Art Center, and the High Museum. Many thanks to Julian Cox and Stuart Harodner at the Contemporary and to Joe Massey for helping us bring tonight's event to fruition. We also owe thanks to the Fulton County Arts Council, the Metropolitan Atlanta Arts Fund, the Georgia Council for the Arts, and the City of Atlanta Office of Cultural Affairs for their support. And of course, we all owe thanks to you for believing in our programs and supporting us. Thank you. And of course, um, tonight we have some very special guests with us. And to introduce them to you all will be our moderator for the evening, the curator at the Contemporary, Mr. Stuart Harodner. All right, so I guess I need to start by a slight programming note, which is that we had initially invited Andrea Barnwell Brownlee, who is the curator at Spelman College, to be a part of this evening when it had been originally scheduled a month or so earlier. And so we just kind of, she couldn't be with us in this, in this round, but it prompts me to cite a, a recent New Yorker cartoon that I saw, which has several people looking quite like us, sitting on a dais, and the the um, punchline at the bottom says, the subject of tonight's discussion is why there are no women on this panel. <laughs> <laughs> and so I thought just as a little shout out to our friend uh, Andrea, we would, we would start with, with that. Um, <clears throat> just to give you a sense of who is on the dais here. Um, Harry Shear is a prominent satirist, uh, to many of you known as Derek Smalls of Spinal Tap. Uh, <laughs> and. And also the voice of numerous characters on The Simpsons. He's the host of a fabulous radio show called Le Show, which is a comedy and music and, and critical cultural uh, platform, really. Um, he's a blogger for the Huffington Post. He's an ex-writer for Saturday Night Live. And his ec silent echo chamber, which is currently on view at the Contemporary and for now two more days, uh, has been exhibited obviously here, but also at the Aldrich Museum in Connecticut at um, Susan Inglet Gallery in New York City, the Renaissance Society in Chicago, and is making its way around the country and the world, in effect, uh, in the next year or so. So if you haven't seen it, I would urge you to take advantage of the next day or so. Um, to Harry's right is Jim Clancy, who many of you may know is an anchor and correspondent at CNN. Uh, he's won the George Polk Award for reporting on the genocide in Rwanda. He's an Emmy Award winner for reporting on the famine um, an international intervention in Somalia. He joined CNN after an extensive career in radio and TV in Denver and San Francisco. We're very happy he's here with us as well. And Michael David Murphy, who many of you know as the Atlanta photographer, but also program manager for Atlanta Celebrates Photography, which Amy just said ended its very successful month of October. Um, and in terms of his relationship to the heady uh, political expertise on the panel, panel, I think it's important to say he has a dog named Cronkite. <laughs> That's true. Who couldn't be here tonight? Right. <laughs> she's in a small crate, she's yelping, she really wished she could make it. But. So what you saw at the entrance, the giant images uh, of various anchor pairs, combinations of uh, newscasters, if you haven't seen the show, this is a little bit of a taste of what is waiting for you at the Contemporary, which is Harry's exhibition, The Silent Echo Chamber, which really presents political figures, uh, media pundits, and anchors of one kind or another in the moments before they are on live broadcast. And so these are satellite grabs. They present these figures in the very awkward moments before they go on. We're going to try to spend some time tonight talking about Harry's intentions for this work, ways in which the work is understood by some of the very interesting people here with us, and then at some point after we're finished chewing on some of that, we would welcome your, your questions about uh, any of the topics we, we cover. 
So I guess I want to first really ask Harry and I, I give him an opportunity to talk a little bit about your interest in these seemingly unguarded moments, uh, how you come to potentially be interested in these uh, figures and their silence uh, before they go live, what, what they reveal, why you're interested in them. And so. um, thanks. Uh, I guess it starts, as I was saying to you uh, privately, with uh, my perpetual amazement that um, a, a medium which was uh, in its introduction to humanity uh, brooded uh, about as uh, the ultimate visual medium has for good and sufficient, that is to say economic reasons, basically devolved into uh, uh, a medium where people sit and yak at you, uh, that is to say television. Uh, you know, it's it, the cheapest form of television. Fred, Fred Allen once said the, 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 the imitation is the sincerest form of television. And uh, <laughs> I would say that, that uh, two people sitting in a studio the size of a phone booth uh, arguing about uh, anything is the cheapest form of television. And, and so that's what we have these days. And it, so when this imagery became available to me, um, the first thing that I thought of, uh, uh, other people have, have played with this kind of imagery. There was a film in, in, that came out in 1992 called Feed. And, the, and the, the joke of Feed was getting people being awkward and, and doing embarrassing things. And I thought, I, I, before, long before I saw Feed, I thought, it's the easiest thing in the world. Anybody who's ever played with videotape knows that you can stop, frame somebody during an eye blink and they look like they're sleepwalking. So it's, a, it's an easy game to play. But I wanted to catch uh, people that I'm obsessed with, which are basically politicians and, and news media people, uh, in the act of not talking uh, to try to revive the sense that this is a visual medium and to try to play with your perception of these people. Um, when people are talking at you, and I say at you as opposed to to you, but even if people are talking to you in, in interpersonal real conversations, you don't tend to visually look at them the same way as you do if, if they're not. You're, you, for some reason, even though the, the visual is prim has primacy in the human brain, the, the act of having to hear words coming at you fast kind of uh, disengages a great part of the, of the observational apparatus. Uh, you're still seeing it, but you're not processing in the same way. So I just, that's sort of the, the highfalutin part of it. And then the, the uh, and then I just thought that having been through this process myself, of course, as Jim has, and, and uh, you know, th this is the moment when you're putting on your TV persona. You're, this is the moment when they are, if you're lucky, being caught in the process of going from the person they actually are to the person they want the public to believe they are. And it's sort of a crucial moment uh, because we're surrounded by, I think, as, as at no other time in human history, surrounded by artifice. It's interesting to, it's, and, and maybe even important to start seeing the creation of the artifice more and more, because there's just more and more of it. So those would be two thoughts I have about it. Can you talk just for a minute about the range of people who are presented? You have, obviously, uh, CNN people, Fox News people, MSNBC, uh, MSNBC people. It seemed to me uh, obvious that you were being quite uh, democratic in mm -hmm. your range, and even though you might have a, a leaning one way or another, that, that in this format you were clearly interested in showing that maybe there's something to be learned by watching all, all of, of these people, no matter what their political. Yeah, there's strikes. nothing. There's nothing programmatic about it. I'm not picking on you know. Oh, look, these people I disagree with look like fools. Uh, no, uh, the idea is to say that there's there there are common threads of humanity <clears throat> that are displayed throughout all of the range of these people: the Republicans and the Democrats, the MSNBCers and the Foxers. Uh, there's no real difference in, to me in the way that there are individual differences. That's what's interesting is, is to watch each individual sort of composing or 
decomposing uh, as the, the cameras train on them. And it also, you know, I have to say, the idea, the, the, the germ of the idea, as I told you, uh, came when I was working at NBC and had all this imagery coming into my office. And um, it was the first time I really became aware that never before in human history has just human behavior, just a person sitting, being themselves, uh, been so thoroughly documented as in our age where all these people, for their own reasons, come in and, and sit well lit in front of a camera. And the ca they're not there for that purpose. They're there to talk. But willy-nilly, their human behavior is being documented. And I thought, somebody should save this. <laughs> and then, and I nominated myself. But before I ask Jim a, a question, would you just share what you told us earlier at the gallery about your background in terms of education? No. Because I found this totally fascinating and very worth revealing in terms of interest in the kinds of things that Harry seems to be interested in. Oh, God, we mean what I studied? Yeah. Yeah, I majored in political science, but I didn't tell you why I majored in political well, science. Well, we, we invited a couple hundred people for you to tell us why. Okay. I'm, I'm, and this is, this is uh, the advice I give my, God, my goddaughter and godson and, and any other uh, person of college age who asks me. I, uh, majored in political science because it was the major at UCLA that required the least number of units in the major. <laughs> and I minored in Russian. So, здравствуйте, как вы поживаете? Jim, when you came and visited the gallery, uh, you know, as you were looking at it, I thought, God, this is, I can't think of anybody who would have a more immediate, specific, informed take on what Harry had, had created. Can you talk a little bit about how you came to see, I mean, what you thought when you saw that work and well, what you, know, I, you look at this, you see it, I see it every day. And the first thing I thought was, God, why didn't I think of this? <laughs> uh, and then the other thing I thought almost immediately was, oh my God, he's revealing us. Everybody who comes to a television station to make their guest appearance, I don't care how many times they've done it, they go through a mode in minutes, seconds, preparing mentally for that appearance. They know what the topic is, that's fine. But what if they twist the question? Even for the anchor people, they're going to have to spar perhaps with the people that they've invited to be with them. Maybe those people, you know, aren't all their exact cup of tea. So everyone has to process, everybody has to think about this. And it's called the silent echo chamber, but for me as I looked at it, it was anything but silent, mm. anything but silent. I could hear the churning gears <laughs> in their minds. I could hear Henry Kissinger thinking off Deutsch. You know, it, you can just look at them and you see different things, but what you see isn't necessarily what they're thinking. It's a reflection of what you believe about them. And so it's reflecting you just as much because you're having to fill in the gaps, and it's powerful. Cool. Can I quote you? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, you, I mean, as somebody who spends a fair amount of time dealing with, you know, imagery and presenting, you know, sort of content un under ACP, we were talking a little bit about just how you were seeing this work. I'd like to see if you could sort of talk about it, but also in the relationship to, uh, the notion of critical commentary and humor and the intersection of politics and those things. I know you're interested yeah, in them. A, that's so a lot there, Stuart. But uh, <coughs> generally, uh, feel around the, in there and find yeah, something to talk about. One of the things we, we find ourselves talking about a lot in the office, Amy and I, and looking at photography and thinking about photography, where are these things going, what's happening with the medium. Um, and it kind of, the conversation often comes around to image glut and what is, what is this kind of big wave of imagery and photos that's coming at everyone, all of us, all the time. And how do you kind of make sense of it? And in thinking about Harry's piece, uh, I, you know, it's this very thin slice of human behavior, anchor people just before they go live. And in thinking about Le Show, you know, where, where Harry's taking, looking at all the news and taking just the apologies of the week. <laughs> you know, and how you can, how you can slice the stream in ways that comment upon the greater whole. So I'm, I'm kind of curious about that and 
those sli the, what well, the decisions are about those we, slices. We are inundated, and um, the the theory, the 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 brand that has been sold to us is that we're inundated uh, by information. Uh, but I told Jim b b in the in the lobby while we were waiting for you all to show up that um, uh, to me uh, a, a signal moment in, in my understanding of all this and trying to process it came when uh, I, I encountered Brian Williams of NBC News in New Orleans nine, nine months after the disaster there and I said to him uh, look and I was in public it was a question and answer session and I said look we know you are smart and, and a funny guy because I've known you before you were the anchor of the nightly news and we know you care about New Orleans because you spent two nights in the Superdome under horrible circumstances so why is it that now, then, nine months after the disaster, people who watch your broadcast don't know why New Orleans flooded. And he said, we just feel that the emotional stories are more compelling for our audience. Uh, and it, 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 it crystallized for me something that goes through this work and, and a lot of the other stuff I do, which is it's called the information age and all it really lacks is information. <laughs> That's the, that's the only missing ingredient. Uh, we are flooded with images, we're flooded with sounds, our technology for creating and replicating and manipulating uh, image and sound is unmatched in the history of human beings and we still don't know one thing more than we did when, uh, you know, it was drums telling, sending the message. Uh, we, 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 the minute we discover these tools, we bend them to uh, purposes other than informing. Um, and, and so part of what I'm interested in in, in in this is the people who are, you know, they're no, I, I, I collect all of this stuff, but what I, what I choose to show, what is interesting to me to show is not actors or sports figures, although I have plenty of them doing, waiting to go on television as well. What's interesting to me to show is politicians and, and media people because they frame our understanding of the world that we're in. And um, you, you can't really brandish a weapon uh, to say, why aren't you telling us what you should be telling us? The closest I can come is to make fun of them and or to catch them in, in this moment of, of uh, semi-psychological undress. All of these media people he's talking about are the gatekeepers. Mm -hmm. But think about it like a rodeo. You know, the bull doesn't move much when it's in the pen. It's only <laughs> after they open the gate. You know, and then it's the next eight seconds, the sound bite to produce it. And the challenge is, well, it's not even a challenge because it's an impossibility. Are you going to solve any of the major problems that face not only our nation but our world today in that 22 second sound bite? And that's what they're called on to do. They're thinking, how do I boil this down to 22 seconds? And one of, of which, I, of you, of which uh, CNN and all the other networks are eventually going to distill or harvest eight. Exactly. Well, I, you know, radio even more than that yeah. today. It's getting, getting faster and faster and faster. And one of the things that appeals to me about this silent echo chamber is I get a couple of minutes to spend with these guys. More. It's more anchor time than you'll see with Anderson Cooper anywhere, <laughs> you know, because they don't keep him on camera that long. Right. It's, always, it, it's always a camera turn or something, but here you see him, and, and he, to, to my mind, he was about the most real mm -hmm. of anybody, because you can see a little nervous energy, and he's working it off, and he's thinking about what he's got coming up. But I love the way that it's all silent, because we have plenty of those moments when there's equipment failures and things, and there's a lot of back and forth. But this allows you to look into the eyes and into the motions of the people that are up there, whether they're newsmakers or the, they are these news gatekeepers. And it, it's rewarding. And I don't care how many times you see it, it's something different every time. Well, thanks. Uh, I, I also think that there's something eerie about it, it devoid of, mm -hmm. of who these people are and their role in our society, in just seeing uh, uh, moving images basically sort of staring back at you. Uh, uh, the, 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 there's an eeriness, I think. Well, I mean, I, I don't know how many people in the audience or on the table have ever seen, you know, sort of Warhol screen tests <laughs> or any number of, you know, sort of moments where there is a kind of 
I'm, and this is, you know, the sort of Warholian genius probably, on the level of I'm just going to look, what happens when you look at the things which are very uh, apparent in front of you, but you have not looked at them either for the long enough duration or with the sense that somebody just changed the frame on you and said, this thing here might be news, this thing to the left in this frame might be art. And so all of a sudden your, your, your frame and your, your uh, thinking about that totally shifts. But I, I'm intrigued by, because just by virtue of both of you guys talking about the speed of the current situation and also what might be possible within that format, can you talk a little bit about how you grew into your experiences as young men with media and this kind of information? Just because, you know, back to his dog, uh, there was a time where maybe slightly more in-depth analysis was happening and there was a different sense of camaraderie with who was on the broadcast potentially and so the, the notion of I mean you know the trust factor in in Cronkite as opposed to a question of you know what do we think about the folks who are giving us this information now are they our friends do we feel like we know them do we trust them um, could you talk a little bit about how you might have encountered these things as younger men interested in people delivering this kind of information well, you know, as a young journalist, it was always my goal to tell the whole story. And sometimes I went to excess, I admit it. But there was a year when at, at CNN and a time at CNN International particularly, I can remember back in Lebanon in the early 1980s, where I could take six and a half minutes and tell a story. And it would air on CNN. And as the correspondents were added and the shows were added and the experts were added, what has happened is we went down to two minutes for a maximum story time, then we went down shorter than that. And there's a lot of talk. Of course, there, there's always the venue out there of the documentary. But even when you do these documentaries, they, they don't want to take the time a lot of times to explore a personality, to bring out a character as much as they would at one time in my career. And it's not as rewarding to do it that quickly. It's, I don't think the audience ever gets to know them. I think one of the strengths of looking at the silent echo chamber is these are all people you have never ever seen them live moving but not talking for that length of time yeah I, I grew up as a news junkie uh, I uh, thought very seriously about making a career in it uh, I was saying to Jim before uh, Ironically, I, I thought seriously about the newspaper business because it'll always be here. Um, <laughs> I knew journalists. I worked as, uh, in journalism. I worked at Newsweek. No, I said I worked in journalism. Um, <laughs> scratch that. Um, but I worked, I, I, I freelanced as a journalist. So uh, journalists were my friends, uh, or so I thought. Um, and, um, you know, I was of an age where, where Cronkite, on the one hand, and uh, the late, uh, great in many ways, Paul Harvey, on the other, were my daily companions in terms of trying to help me figure out the world. Uh, it's interesting, parenthetically, that though Cronkite gets uh, the major credit for turning the country against the Vietnam War, uh, Paul Harvey, who was a conservative radio commentator in his heyday, which lasted some 50 years, was the most listened to uh, voice on radio in America, dwarfing uh, Rush Limbaugh's audience. Uh, Paul turned against the war about the time his son turned draft age, and that was a, a couple months before Cronkite came back. And, and I, I tend to believe Harvey, who had this huge audience in middle America, had more to do with the country turning against the Vietnam War than, than even Cronkite. But there, there was this time, there, was, there were these uh, people who you sensed were not being told by management, cut it down, uh, make it more emotional, let us, let us feel the, 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 the ticker, meaning the heartbeat of it, uh, could actually give you informational content. Um, I suspect that that all began to change when uh, the news divisions of the three major networks, which were at that time our major source for news, uh, ceased being loss leaders, uh, ceased being subsidized by the uh, entertainment side, which was the tradition, and the, uh, as the, comp the 
broadcasters got sold to bigger and bigger companies, uh, consultants and accountants came in and said, well, why is this department not supposed to make a profit? Why should there be a part of this company that doesn't make a profit? What's that? What, 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 since when are we in the charity business? And suddenly the news division had to show a profit itself. And everything changed from that day. So this is the well, genius of the Patty Chayefsky network yeah. moment. But right? if you are, you know, I don't, I, there are some people out here, I know you remember the little chime, this network station is a member of the National Association of Broadcasters. <laughs> In order to have a license, which everybody knew, everybody knew it's a license to print money. That's what a broadcast license but they really had a, is in this country. They had a code of good practices, didn't they? They had a code of good practices. <laughs> you were required to put so much news on the air. In order to justify that license, you had to put on so much news. And you had to put on so much current affairs, as they called it. That's what always ended up on Sunday mornings. But and Ted Turner had something to do with this. Nobody believed there could be a 24-hour news network for several reasons on several levels. One of them was the production. We had seen a half an hour newscast be produced and we thought, my God, you couldn't repeat this 48 times a day. There's just too much insanity involved. We didn't realize that it would actually be easier than that because the deadline that was missed, there's another show following it. But moreover, it proved that you could make money with the news. And then people found out you can make money with the news if there's a little bit more entertainment in the news. And then we can make even more money if there's a little sensationalism in the news. And suddenly, things grew. And the news has evolved. The news now, today, makes more money than a lot of other shows. And, and Cable News Network, Fox News, all the 24-hour channels that, believe me, stretch around the world are evidence of that. The news is being sold. But at what price? Mm -hmm. And, and I, I think, I, I just add one thing to that. I'm, I'm old enough to remember when, if you watched uh, a beauty pageant and uh, you saw a contestant say, my, my goal is to be a news anchor, it was a laugh line. And now it's the truth. So and they're some of the most successful ones. I know. So, uh, uh, Jim, you're talking about this, this growth and the speed and, and how it's changed more toward entertainment. And I, I'm wondering, Harry, if like all this information that's being created is one of the byproducts is that we're getting into this kind of golden age of satire, that there's so much available to potentially turn in the way that you're turning it here. I'm yeah, you, you know, uh, yes and no. I mean, I, I think this week has been a great example of both the yes and the no. Uh, on the one hand, uh, everybody in, in, uh, with a, a, a slight uh, satirical license has uh, thought uh, there's a gold mine in the Sarah Palin book tour. And, uh, you know, some very funny stuff has happened. <laughs> but me personally, I, I, you know, and I'd love to be part of the crowd, and, and I've, God knows I've done my share of Sarah, Sarah Palin stuff. I did a, a, a music video called Bridge to Nowhere last year, so I got on the on the, on the wagon, but there are a couple of nagging thoughts in the back of my head about this. One is, uh, when the Sarah Palin, oh let's be charitable and call it a phenomenon, uh, has taken up so much oxygen in the straight, and again a term of art, the straight news world, uh, do we in the satirical community just add to the profusion of, pardon my language, bullshit noise by now reflecting on that phenomenon, uh, thereby closing off even another avenue of discussion of something that may be more significant in, in the world, uh, satirically, mm -hmm. reacting to, oh, let's say this, uh, uh, I'll use the old Mad Magazine adjective, for Schlugen or War we we're in. Um, and are we basically serving her, ultimately. We're not, you know, satire uh, to me is always supposed to at least uh, a little bit wound the powerful. It's not supposed to serve their, their interests. When, when basically you sense that her interest at this point is getting attention for selling a book or other reasons, uh, I'm, I'm sort of, uh, uh, 
Paul Harvey, whom I referred to earlier, used to have this habit when he reported about a story that he thought really didn't deserve the, the coverage that it was getting. He would say at the end of it, the person involved would like me to tell you his name, but wouldn't. Uh, <laughs> Which I thought was great. He told you the story, but would just leave out the, you know, so he wouldn't be a party to the, to the spectacle. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, do we, in the satirical community, such as, that, that's, there's a construct for you. Is there cards? And yeah, right. Oh, and the, and the picnics are great. Um, I wouldn't eat the food, though. Um, but do we just fall prey to the same thing that the, that the news media are falling to, uh, prey to, which is just, made you look, just part of the made you look club. So I probably won't say a word about Sarah Palin this Sunday as a result. Uh, but yes, there are uh, <laughs> uh, certainly as the rules for getting into the public sphere have all been dispelled, you know, uh, when the words reality TV star can be said with a straight face mm -hmm. uh, by even the, the trade magazines that cover show business, we'll use that phrase now without blinking, then, you know, the rules of getting into the public sphere have like totally been exploded, then of course it's a field day for satirists. Mm -hmm. yeah. One of the questions that comes up almost every time someone has encountered this exhibition was the question of the legalities of it. And so, quite often people have asked me, and I would now ask you, and apropos of your earlier comment about working in the art world or presenting this in the art world, was the question of what were any concerns or actual issues uh, involved in obtaining what is, for the most part, what you called found objects, mm -hmm. I mean, in that you had access to them, mm -hmm. but one doesn't ask how you had access, or one... And one doesn't does, tell. And one doesn't tell. Um, <laughs> but one does maybe have the question of, you know, is there a issue around the legalities of presenting it, and does, in some sense, your um, affable notoriety help in presenting this, in that, who, you know, what, there's no real, you know, you know, in some level, you're one of them, kind of, mm -hmm. and so maybe there's no real sense that you're taking advantage of it in quite the same way that someone might, someone other might? Yeah. Or, you know, yeah. I mean, just could you talk a little bit about the legal? Yeah. Or? Uh, uh, and I'm not a lawyer, and I don't play one on TV, so uh, anything, don't, don't, don't use don't anything him. I, yeah, don't, don't rely <laughs> on anything I'm about to say. Um, I have a few times put this, uh, put groupings of this material on television. Uh, Every campaign year, I do what I, uh, I call the silent debate, which I take the candidates for president and get this kind of footage of them and, and present them in, in a debate where no, not a word is spoken. Because um, I think that's, it, it, it's, it saves you a lot of time. <laughs> the words really aren't that important, as it turns out. They don't mean them anyway, um, which is sort of the message of that. Um, and I put that on HBO. Uh, back in 1988, and uh, there, you know, HBO is lawyered up the, the wazoo, uh, and they they wondered about this, um, but they came down on the side of fair comment, and all the, there's a, a doctrine in the First Amendment law called fair comment. Um, I did a quiz show about the news on Comedy Central a few years back, and and the the final round involved the the real panelists competing against some celebrities uh, who were seen on video screens, and of course the celebrities never answered the questions because they were silent. Um, and <laughs> Diane Sawyer, who was one of the celebrities, had her lawyer call and, and demand that we take it off the air. But fortunately the show had been canceled by that point, so <laughs> it was moot. Um, I said to Stuart, one of the reasons I do this in the, in the art space, because I'm, I'm no artist, is that um, I, I thought, uh, well, you know, I tell them, it's in a gallery, it's in a museum. What are you going to sue for? You know, the admission costs? There's no money to, you know, there's not like, <laughs> this is not a, a money-making proposition. Um, and more deeply, um, the discussions that I've had with attorneys have revolved around issues of copyright. 
And mm -hmm. uh, in another context, I've had long discussions with attorneys about this because uh, a few years back on the radio, I started to say uh, privacy law is so fragile in this country, and yet so much information is being collected about us and being packaged and sold. You know, when you have a loyalty card at the supermarket, your price for the few cents you get off on each item is now somebody has your entire purchasing history and they sell that. And uh, privacy law can't help you with that, so I, I started advocating copyright your life. And if they sell your information, it's copyright infringement. And half the attorneys that talked to me said, yeah, it's a good idea, and the other half said, you can't do that. And I said, why? They said, well, copy, you can only copyright a creative act, a creative work. And I said, in response, what is a creative work except a series of choices. And your purchasing history is every bit as much a series of choices as I'll make this square blue. Um, so when people bring up the, the question of copyright with regard to this material, because after all, CBS or NBC or CNN paid for the camera and paid for the lights, my question is, in what would the copyright inhere? Mm -hmm. What would be the choices aside from the guy getting into the car or the woman coming, getting into the car and coming to the studio in the first place, that they would be protecting. Um, that question hangs in the air to this moment. Michael, you have a question for any of these? Any, any, any Jim or, or well, Aaron? Well, you picked up the copyright thread, and, and, and I, I liked what you were saying about uh, how you, in some ways it seems like you're stand a step ahead of the discussion. Mm -hmm. The discussion hasn't caught up with you and closed something down, let's say, as That's it has right. with other people. And same things are happening in music and with Shepard Ferry and just trying to stay ahead of that copyright curve. And do you, it, do you feel like this is a, a one-time project? Or? Oh, God, no. No, okay. no, no. I've been doing this first. The, 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 the overall thing is called a non-talking heads. That's the name of the whole idea, and I've been doing non-talking heads pieces since 1988. Uh, the, the reason that it's now come to Atlanta and, and, and getting to tour around the world is that they, in 2004, a gallery owner in Washington, D.C. asked me to do a piece that was specific to the campaign. It was right before the presidential election in Washington, D.C. I thought, well, how can I resist that? So I did a show called FaceTime. Um, and I, this is the first time that really a piece has sort of traveled in time and space, because normally somebody says, I want you to do something in Atlanta, I'll, I'll create a specific piece for that. But uh, a gallery owner in New York uh, did, asked me to do this, and, and she liked it, and so it's, it's been traveling. So no, I've been doing this for a long time, and then I, I have a, a, a different set of pieces that I, I do and I put mainly on the internet at, at mydamnchannel.com called Found Objects, mm -hmm. which are talking pieces. Uh, so, for example, the, the piece of, uh, I, have, I guess the most famous is, is uh, John Edwards working on his hair during the 2004 campaign. And the second most famous is Dan Rather trying to decide uh, in Seattle whether to wear the trench coat or not. And if so, call her up or call her down. Um, so no, I've been doing this for quite a while. I, I, I was curious about what the next phase of it could be or... 3D! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the silent sound bites. Yeah. And it is fair use. I'm sorry, it's fair use. You can only say, well, I was, you know, you're allowed to use something like two minutes or 30 seconds at least of somebody, you just get off the television screen, you say, I'm just waiting for him to say something, that's all. Mm -hmm. And you know, obviously the networks all play that game with each other. Uh, you watch CNN's uh, uh, State of the uh, Union on Sunday morning, and they fill 15 minutes with stuff from Meet the Press and Face the Nation and uh, This Week with David Brinkley and say, we watch them so you don't have to. Nothing could be more uh, supposedly <laughs> We're just trying to help out. Come violative <laughs> of other companies' copyrights than that. And uh, I don't, I don't, I'm not that brazen. Well, we, they've, they've fought over it for years, and they've gotten it down to a science. Everybody knows they're allowed to use so many seconds, so many, a couple of minutes, and they can't use it in teases. Yeah, and, and the other thing that I think is interesting and that you only realize when you work in the, in the field, and, and again, when I was at NBC, this became way obvious to me, is they're all looking at each other's stuff all the time. They're all seeing each other's 
feeds come in. We're the only ones who, who don't see all this. They're seeing all this stuff in each other's. The guys at NBC are watching Rather. The guys at the CBS are watching Brokaw. They're all seeing each other's stuff. More shows are ruined like that than you can imagine. Because even internationally, I have producers that are in the control room. They're watching what's on the television networks like BBC and Sky. And not they'll come in and they'll say, you. They're, not, they're not watching what's on our air <laughs> at all. No. They're seeing what the other guys are doing, and then they get nervous, and they say, well, he's got this, he's got this. It happened to me when they were voting on the Olympic cities, and, and, and the, the, we knocked out of a three-and-a-half-minute story that was beautiful in order to get to the guy explaining to everybody, now, if you wanted to uh, vote for Rio de Janeiro, press the blue button. <laughs> if you wanted to vote, I mean, killed the story, cut out in the middle, and the excuse was, well, all the others were on it. We're going to vote on the city. They didn't vote on the city for two and a half minutes. Mm -hmm. you know? And it's just panic and hysteria to follow the other guys. And uh, it happens all the time. Wa everybody's watching everybody else. And that's not limited to news, by the way. When I uh, broke into radio and was working at a, at a rock and roll radio station in, in the, uh, Los Angeles in the, uh, long ago, uh, and uh, I would go into the booth. I, I was doing the satirical newscast with, with my colleagues, and, but I would every once in a while be forced to visit the disc jockeys in their booths, who were the stars of the station, of course. Uh, just ask them. Just ask them. <laughs> and we were at the number two station in town. And uh, they were never listening to their, their show. They were listening to the number one station to see what they were playing. Nobody's listening to their own stuff. You, you know, and, and you try to explain it to them. You try to say, you know what, the guys that are watching us or listening to us, they're not simultaneously listening to the other guys. So just do a good job. Yeah. But they're, it's lost on them. It's kind of the nervousness of, of management and the media. Yeah, and, and you know, you, that raises an interesting point. Uh, we have heard for so many years, and th this is one thing that I think this, this, th these pieces are, are, are trying to work against in their own small way. We've heard for so many years our attention span is shrinking. And I will present what I think is the, is the uh, rebuttal to that uh, with three words and two initials, the O.J. Simpson trial, where a vast percentage of the American public sat transfixed for months of the most boring court procedure imaginable because they were interested in the story. And it just dragged on and on, and, and we were all there. Our attention span is fine. The attention spans that have been fragmented and fractured are those in management of the media. They're the ones who, if this show doesn't get a, a sufficient rating within the first half hour it's on the air, they're pushing the button right now, they're, because nothing fractures the attention span more than fear, and that's what media executives live in. I'm not asking you to comment on that because they pay your salary. <laughs> we resemble that remark. <laughs> um, I, I think it would, be, it would behoove us to sort of shift some of the focus and ask some audience members who I'm sure in part come because they might like to have a question answered um, to potentially ask uh, any of the three participants a uh, question. So Amy, maybe you could figure that out. Yes, sir? But you think I'm going to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow, because we're good friends, that I'll... Quien sabe? <laughs> uh, no, I, 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 you know, I'm like the CIA, sources and methods. Sources and methods. We don't talk about that. Um, it's, it, it just, I, I don't like, I'm not trying to be coy or, or, or silly. Uh, However I do it, if the more I would talk about it, uh, the more I would endanger the ability to continue getting it. Hey, so it would be self-defeating. Harry, can I just a, a follow-up on, on that? Is can you tell us maybe how you felt the first time that you saw something like it? Oh yeah, um, early on uh, when I was I've been collecting this stuff for almost three decades now. Um, shocking that anybody does anything for three decades, especially when you find it's yourself. Um, but um, early on in this period, um, 
ABC TV had a format for World News Tonight, which had three anchors, as you remember. Peter Jennings in London, Frank Reynolds in Washington, <laughs> and Max Robinson, the first African-American anchor on a, a major network in Chicago. And Max Robinson had maybe two lines per show. On Wall Street, stocks were up today in active trading, and maybe one other line. And because of the techni technical complexity of the show, they did it three times each night. They did a 6 o'clock to get the kinks out. They did a 6.30, which went to most of the East Coast, and they did a 7 o'clock for possible updates. So Max Robinson was in his chair for an hour and a half a night. And some of the first imagery I ever got was of this guy who was spending an hour and a half of his day every day on camera to say about 40 words every half hour. And it just was mesmerizing. And I went, mmm. <laughs> Any other questions from the audience? Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I wonder, uh, I, I have to say when I first went to the exhibit, of course, I, I also thought like probably 80% of the people here, it was going to be like b blooper reel kind of like people embarrassing themselves. And Stacy was there and I was looking at Chris Matthews and I said, I thought that people were going to be moving. And Chris <laughs> Matthews is like so still. But um, I wonder if you thought about also, and Jim, you alluded to this a little bit when you were talking about how you were forced to take the Olympic vote early because everyone was freaking out and then you had to sit on it for two and a half minutes before they actually voted. And two and a half minutes to most of us here probably isn't very much time, but it's a in television <laughs> production, you're freakily aware of you know, milliseconds and even as, as uh, television consumers, you're aware of, of time if you don't hear someone talking. And I wonder, and when I watched your exhibit, when I looked at the people in the exhibit, I thought about how it seemed to slow time down. Mm -hmm. Because these people that you see usually talking were not talking. And it, and it actually created this atmosphere of like calm and mm -hmm. relief. Mm -hmm. Did you think about that when you were when you're putting it together? Yeah, what well, it, I mean, what it does, does to time? Be, because I'm I'm such an avid consumer of the product, uh, I'm aware of the of the jangly effect it has on me, especially as the pace has increased, especially as the noise level of the promos. I mean, just just as a as a a, a study exercise, when you next turn on CNN. Try not when the when the promotional announcements for the next show or the show coming up on Sunday when those announcements are are run. Try not to listen to the voice of the of the announcer who's yelling at you, and instead concentrate on the sound of the music that they have behind it, and and just or on Fox for that matter, but CNN I, uh, especially, and and see how often in the course of that music track something that resembles an explosion, a big drum <laughs> thing is happening. That's my theme music, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the sound I associate with you, too. I like it. <laughs> when, I, when I hear that sound, I think it, it, it's all meant to jangle. Uh, it's all meant to, uh, and I, I, again, take this cue from what Brian Williams said, it's all meant to create an emotional state, whatever that state may be. There's a goal state they have in mind. This doesn't happen by accident. If you, if you listen to promos from 10 years ago or 20 years ago, it's evolved steadily in the direction of louder, noisier, more startle sounds per second. Um, so yeah, uh, but when you were talking about it, I, I, I thought, yeah, we're, it's almost Einsteinian playing with time that way, you know, changing the, the experience of time, because they're trying to create this hopped up, sped up, urgent sense of constant urgency. Now one of the reasons they're doing that, I believe, is because starting with probably the first real glory period of CNN, uh, the Persian Gulf War, they could look at their ratings and see that when a big event happened, like the Persian Gulf War, or like the OJ trial, their ratings would spike. And when times were normal, their ratings would, would fall to a, 
a, a norm which was substantially lower than that. And at that point, people decided, not just at CNN, but at Fox and MSNBC too, that their job was to try to create an emotional environment that more nearly resembled a crisis, whether one was existing or not. And that's what we're living through, is a, a period of perpetually manufactured crisis. Thank you for the setup. Because <laughs> it, it, it allows me to say, not NPR. And, and I, will, I will, even though I do a, a radio show on public radio, it has nothing to do with NPR. It doesn't go through the Washington bureaucracy. And I'll tell you the two events that really broke it for me with NPR and uh, the response of an NPR producer when I told him this. Uh, during the run-up to the Iraq war, uh, if you listen to the NPR output, uh, they were every bit as credulous as Judy Miller at the New York Times uh, and the Washington Post. Uh, the difference is that the New York Times and the Washington Post apologized afterwards, and NPR never did. And then uh, a, an event that has sort of dominated my serious side for the last four and a half years, the uh, flooding of New Orleans, NPR was equally as lazy and stupid on that story as most of the other national news media. Uh, and I just thought, well, the two news stories that mattered most in, the, in that period of time, NPR got wrong. And I mentioned this to a friend of mine who was a producer uh, at one of the signature news broadcasts at NPR. And he said, well, I can tell you this about the, the run-up to the, to the uh, Iraq war. Uh, our executive producer of news at the time uh, was a guy who would covered the Gulf War and when the war drums started beating his only questions were uh, okay who do we send where and how do we get them there and he said the other thing was that we were very aware that we were we had this reputation as the Bush bashing network and we leaned over backwards to try to feed to try to avoid feeding that so I said well good you got this is Crocs money and a few hundred thousand people died that's an even up deal the answer to your question is I think it's a bad idea to, to rely on any one source. Uh, I think even Jim would agree. Uh, you know, I, I, I tell you, I go to the internet, I go to uh, you know, newspapers around the world, I read between four and six in the morning, I'll hit 12 newspapers, all different kinds of uh, viewpoints. You've got to have multiple sources of mm -hmm. news. And I have access to the mainframe. I mean, so I, I can read the wires, you know, hours ahead of anybody else. Uh, and you can too, Associated Press, Reuters, go out and read them there. And I mean, those are a couple of sources, but if you want anything with attitude, you've got to go to European papers, Middle East papers, uh, you know, uh, Asian, Asian pa papers. You've got to look around the world because everybody's got a different viewpoint. Yep. A and they really see things differently from those different angles. I would highly recommend, for example, it's available on the internet, Al Jazeera English. Uh, they're they're clearly, they have a, a, a point of view, as Jim says, but they're, they're very often these days the only uh, television network that has a reporter who, who is on the scene of an event in a country that uh, American networks, most, most often CNN excluded, have, have never even heard of. Um, uh, I watch BBC, I watch and listen to a lot of the news from the BBC, the BBC and the Australian Broadcasting uh, Commission, which does two really good radio news broadcasts a day, AM and PM, it's called, they're called, uh, were the ways that I knew, for example, along with the British press, the names of the people high up in the intelligence uh, agencies of the United States, British, and Australian governments, who were saying before the war started, this isn't what the intel shows. Americans don't know those names. NPR listeners don't know those names, but listeners or readers of, of the press from around the world do. Uh, I read the Times of India from time to time, uh, Asia Times online. I mean, I'm, I'm omnivorous, but you, you, get, you, over time, by matching up things and seeing who's reporting which event in which way, get to develop a, a, a web of what you feel is, 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 can be moderately trustworthy, you know, but always with a question mark. I think we have time for one more question. The, the media that we know today, uh, 
I think they're all afraid that, it, that, that where, we, where they'll be 30 years from now is in the, in the dustbin of history. I mean, uh, the newspaper people are all afraid of that. Uh, 30, I, I don't know about 30 years from now, but I think, you know, even within the next 10 years, it's all moving to the Internet, all the 24-hour news. Uh, is going to be out there. Al Jazeera is already available to you because nobody will air it here in this mm -hmm. country. Nobody wants to be, nobody wants to be the cable channel that's the first one to say, "Hey, Al Jazeera looks like a good channel. Let me put that on here." Mm -hmm. You know, they're just not going to do it in this in environment. A lot of people used to work for CNN and the BBC and ITN and all these other perfectly credible networks went to work for Al Jazeera. Mm -hmm. And I know the guy that owns it, the Sheikh that owns oh, really? it, and he donated a huge amount of money to New Orleans. Really? Oh, the, that's right. Of course. You know, yeah. uh, and uh, you know, a fairly good guy, and they've got a little bit of an axe to grind, mm -hmm. and they're going to do it. But uh, it's well, like example, any other source. For example, when you see the weather at the end of each half hour in Al Jazeera, and they show the Middle East weather map, there, there is a certain yeah, who nation who, that doesn't Qatar, have any weather. You've got to know the temperature in Qatar. <laughs> but they, they never show the weather in Israel. It doesn't exist. <laughs> Not I mean. on that map. So you, you take that. But, you know, fair warning. You see their weather map, you know exactly what their slant is. And they actually, they actually, on the news broadcast, bring on Renan Gassin and some of these other, uh, you know, characters. And, uh, you know, Renan that I've known for years from the Israeli side. Renan would stay up nights coming up with a zinger. You know, yeah, I know Arafat wants peace. He wants a piece of this and a piece of that. <laughs> and, you know, uh, so they bring out different sides, too. But uh, where, where is it going? Nobody can tell exactly. The Internet is just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And... All of our digital news gathering now is done via internet. I mean, we don't need uh, the satellites in the field the way that we did in the past. It, when I started with CNN uh -oh. almost 30 years ago, we had to have a 16-wheeler truck to put up that satellite signal. And, uh, seriously, today, I can do it with a briefcase. Mm -hmm. I, I can literally broadcast with a little handy cam and my laptop computer and boom, just hook in that internet cable. I'm on the air with a two-way earpiece, you know, listening to what's going on in the studio. It's phenomenal the change that, that has come to all of that. And it's going to complicate Harry's job, but I'm sure he's <laughs> going to figure out a way to do it. I, I'm really curious, how many people here have actually seen the show? So not everybody. And I, you know, you've got a couple of days left, and I really, really encourage you to see it. Because just as you saw that picture of Chris Matthews up here and the hair is done, he looks like a 50-year-old Dennis the Menace. <laughs> or, I mean, it, it, no, but it depends on if you like him, if you watch his show and like him, you'll say, wow, he looks a little uncomfortable there. It must be cold. Somebody that doesn't like him will have a different view. You, when you walk in the door to see the silent echo chamber, you bring in a part of the show with you. Yeah, I, I, I guess that's the one other thing that I'd say about it is, is that uh, we are, the, the information we get is packaged with an eye, I think more now than ever before to uh, here's what you should think about this or here's the judgment you should take from this or here's what you should conclude about this. So I wanted to present a, a series of images with as little framing uh, as little context, as little of what I think or think I know or know I think uh, as possible and, and, you know, trust you to come to your conclusion about it. And that, I think, is a, is a, a futile little gesture of rebellion in my, in my, in my part against uh, all of the great media forces in our lives because um, I'll bring this in from left field, but when I work with Christopher Guest on the, on the improv movies, the, the feeling that suffuses that enterprise is trust. We are trusted for some magical reason by a company to, to do these things. He trusts us to come up with the dialogue. We trust each other, therefore. And overall, we trust the audience to not have to be hammered into the ground with a, with a punchline. And it's what's most missing from, I think, our relationship with the media as they exist nowadays and it's what I think will lead to their destruction in the hands of the internet is the internet re-empowers at the moment, let's say, before it gets all taken over by Rupert Murdoch. The, <laughs> the internet re-empowers the individual to make the choices and to, and to sort of draw conclusions. So it has a little bit in common with what I feel like I'm doing here, which is to say, you tell me. You tell me what this is. You tell me what he's thinking. You figure it out. 
have a ball. Well, I would just say in the age of the 23-second soundbite, we appreciate a group of people coming to listen to an hour or so of commentary and discussion. <laughs> um, we do urge you, if you haven't seen the show, to see it. Uh, it was a pleasure for me, actually, to watch Jim see the show and <laughs> Harry to I see the show yeah. as well. I mean, it's like the show is, change, is traveling around. It's taking different forms. Uh, how it was presented here is different than other venues. Uh, and I just, again, want to thank all of you for being here and ACP's support. And, and just, it's been a real pleasure presenting this work and hearing you all talk about it tonight. So thank you very much, and everyone enjoy the evening. Thanks for coming.